All right, welcome everybody, and thanks for joining us on this uh, beautiful, beautiful in Puerto Rico anyway, Friday evening. And uh, to talk about, I have to say, not one of my favorite topics, to talk about a topic I've talked about over and over and over again over the many, many years. But it seems it's obviously relevant, it's obviously an issue, it's uh, obviously something that needs to be constantly addressed, and what I am finding more and more is, is there's, there seems to be more and more and more confusion about this. Uh, and uh, my views are um, constantly being misrepresented uh, about this topic of Islam, what to do about Islam, what to do about Muslims, uh, how, to, how to think about it, Islamic immigration, are we at war, are we not at war, what about those gang rapes in, uh, in England? To what extent do they have something to do with Islam in the Muslim world? and uh, in Muslims, and, you know, what do you do about all this? Should we just, should, should, should we not allow them in? Should we kick them out? Should we condemn all Muslims? Should we go to war with Islam? Again, all these issues, every single one of them, I've talked about, but since I see so much uh, misrepresentation of, of what I've said over the years about this issue, uh, I feel compelled to, uh, to kind of try and address it all at once and give you opportunities to ask questions, particularly if you use Super Chat, although, you know, uh, particularly if you use Super Chat. So uh, this is your opportunity to, uh, to ask those questions. Those of you on Facebook, move over to YouTube. YouTube is where the Super Chat is and where you can, uh, you can ask as many questions as you want. Now, I wasn't very motivated to do this uh, because... Most of the people who kind of misrepresent my views on Islam and my views on, on, uh, on the, the, the West's, uh, you know, uh, war of survival uh, are disrespectful, misrepresents my, my views, um, and, and just lie. And, and, and in my view, many of them just can't think So that there's, because they, they can't think. That thinking is nuanced. Thinking, you have to have a lot of what ifs. You have to have, you have to see differences. You can't just lump everything at once. You can't have just simplistic answers for everything. So I was unmotivated to do that. Now I did get a long post from Jason Hornbuckle, which I thought was respectful. Uh, recognized the fact, and I thought this was particularly respectful. Recognized the fact that post 9/11, I did a lot of work on this issue. Uh, and I gave a, a talk, which I think is an important talk. I think that anybody who cares about this issue, anybody who thinks uh, that this issue is important should listen to it. It's my talk on the morality of war. Uh, you, can, you can read it in uh, Winning the Unwinnable War, a, a book edited by Lan Juno and is available on, uh, uh, on Amazon. It was co-authored with Alex Epstein, uh, who I interviewed here. Uh, so important work has been done, I've done, and others have done important work on this issue, on the whole issue of Islam and the whole issue of the war and the whole issue of terrorism. And at least I give Jason credit for knowing that. I would also add to that that if you're really interested in this issue, I did, uh, I did a, uh, what was it, a five-part series on the history of the Middle East, which, uh, which covers a huge amount of content about this topic. Huge amount of context. So, I don't think you can understand what I think about this issue unless you've listened to my History of the Middle East course um, and thought about it, not just listened to it, but thought about it and how it applies to the modern times. And also, I did another four-section course on just the history of Islamic totalitarianism. Now, both of those courses are available as podcasts on Blog Talk Radio, iTunes, Stitcher, every podcasting app available to man, and on YouTube now, so there are no excuses if, if you really are interested in my views on Muslims and Islam, go listen to those courses because they're comprehensive. They, they, they took hours and hours and hours to present, much more than I'm going to do today. And, and if you really want to understand my view on this issue, that's the place to begin. Uh, and if you really want to understand in my view, Islam and, and its evolution over time and what's happened to it and how we got to where we are today, how the Middle East, how, how the whole phenomenon of Islam got to where it is today, I can't think of a better source than those two courses um, are. And again, if, if you haven't listened to them, it, it, it's a real loss. You should. 
And I think it'll give you a deep understanding of the Middle East, the, the context of the Middle East. And I don't cover the Israeli-Palestinian conflict when I talk about the Middle East. I talk about the rise of Islam and its consequences politically, militarily, terrorism-wise to the West. Uh, and uh, again, specifically, there's a course on Islamic totalitarianism. So let me take that all as a context. Because, and then of course, yes, yeah, somebody, uh, Alex mentions, I also did a lot, of, a lot of panels with Daniel Pipes. They, some of them, not all of them, are available on YouTube. So just look them up, you're on book, Daniel Pipes. I can't think of a better thinker on issues relating to the Middle East than Daniel Pipes. Uh, one of the best thinkers on it. There are better thinkers, but one of the best thinkers. And again, a nuanced thinker, not a, not a, not a crazy, uh, one size fit all, let's, let's, you know, let's condemn everybody and, and paint everybody with one big brush, which is not helpful, and it's not thinking. That's not thinking. So um, I want to read. I, I want to read Jason's um, Jason's post. It has a lot of things that I think completely misrepresent my view. And 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 Jason, I just encourage you to 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 listen back to the podcast you're citing and and listen carefully. Rather than again, I, I think this reflects a superficiality of understanding and listening, and take it into the context of everything I've said about Islam, not just a, a soundbite here, soundbite there. I do all these uh, podcasts um, extemporaneously, and it, to some extent, at least, I take into account a particular context that many of you have built over time with me. And if I say something, I expect you to understand that there's a context for it. But Anyway, we'll go over this, and I'll try to answer all the questions and all the challenges he poses in this post. Uh, but really, uh, and I'll point out where I think he's misrepresenting uh, what I say. Uh, but I'm also eager to take questions from you. And again, some of the things I want to cover today is what is Islam? Is it one thing? Is there an ideology named Islam? And anybody who identifies as a Muslim is therefore associated with that ideology. That's the question I want to pose. What's the relationship between evaluating a religion like that and evaluating philosophies or ideologies? Is this equivalent to say you're an advocate of Islam? Is that the same? Should you hold it the same as somebody saying, I'm an advocate of objectivism? Are those the same? How to evaluate different Muslims? And I'll get to the idea that there are such a thing as different Muslims. Um, is there a problem of Islam? And yeah, Obviously, there is, but how big is it? How important is it? Are we at war? How do you win the war? We're covering a lot today. Um, then, in the context of this war, in the context of this problem, how do you deal with immigration? In the context of this war and the context of the problem, how do you deal with assimilation, that is, immigrants that are already here? Do you kick them out? Do you try to assimilate? Is assimilation even possible? Um, and then what do you do about something that Jason raises, the, the whole gang rape, the, uh, the sex in Islam? Are the gang rapes a feature of Islam? And if so, should we condemn all Muslims for these gang rapes or condemn the ideology for the gang rapes or, or ban all Muslims from immigrating because of the gang rapes? So, and then anything else you want to cover and anything else, Jason, that I missed, uh, you can... Uh, 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 you know, Anthony, I appreciate the, um, the super chat, but let's try to stick to the topic because otherwise it's going to go all over the place. There's a ton to cover. I hope, I think you've got, you guys have got a lot of questions about Islam. And now the answer to Anthony's question is simple, so I'm going to answer it. What do you think of James, James Valiant's book, Creating G Christ? I, I, I haven't read it, so I don't have an opinion. So, um, uh, you know, you're going to have to take that for what it's, it, that is the truth. So um, I haven't read it, so um, I, I'm not going to comment on it. But really, try in a, in, the, in a super chat to ask questions about the topic. Otherwise, we'll never get done with this. And, and again, uh, I see a question here. Um, super chat. I'm going to give priority to those to a large extent because I have a lot to say even without your questions. Even without your questions, we'll be lucky if we can get done in an hour. So, so. Let's get going. I want to read you Jason's thing. Um, so he, he says something, but you know, he's been finding, I've been finding myself feeling very frustrated and angry with things you are saying on this show. 
I restrict my comments and questions to one podcast to keep things simple. This is a podcast in which you discuss Tommy Robinson and the UK gang, uh, UK rape gangs. In this podcast, you treat the UK rape gangs actions as if they are incidental to the perpetrators being Muslims and not because of it. Now that's not true. So again, I would encourage you to listen to that again. I, 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 I don't make a big deal, as big of a deal as many do, out of the fact that the Muslims will get to why in a minute. But the, I don't connect it to, to the fact that the Muslims is not true at all. I even talk about the fact that the reason they're not being prosecuted, the reason that there was silence was because they're Muslims and, and nobody wanted to appear uh, to appear politically incorrect or, or racist in going after them. Um, where is it? Uh, you also go on to say that, they, that it is racist to make generalizations about Muslims. Well, it's not racist. I, don't, I, I, I doubt I said that because Islam is not a race. And that any attempt to do so is a crime against individualism. That is true, and we'll talk about that. You also say that it's wrong to be concerned about a politi politician being Muslim. Well, y y we'll talk about that too. It's, it depends what kind of Muslim, and it depends what you mean by concern. It, 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 it's a question of whether the concern should be elevated right, above and beyond a, uh, other ideologies that are problematic. Uh, you know, being a Muslim is problematic. Even being a, what I would call a secular Muslim is problematic. But is it such a concern that we should? No, I mean, uh, I'm much more worried in politics uh, about Marxists than I, about Elizabeth Warren than I am about Muslims. I just don't think they're a political force that matters. The common thread in all these assertions is that Islam as an ideology has no causal efficacy. Listen, listen to my course on the history of the Middle East and on Islamic totalitarianism. How, I mean, of course I, of course I uh, argue everywhere that uh, Islam as an ideology has causal efficacy. But the question is, what is Islam as an ideology? And we're going to talk about that. Since when do objectivists think that ideas do not have causal efficacies? Not this objectivist. Everything I do is about ideas having causal efficacy. Is it rational to say that politicians who subscribe to Marxism is likely to have Marxist sympathies and that these beliefs would influence them in office? And how is it not legitimate to say the same thing about a Muslim? Well, it depends what it means to say somebody's a Muslim. And is it the same as saying somebody is a Marxist? I don't know. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Or an objectivist, for that matter. Again, is it equivalent to say those two things? Is it, is it, what is the meaning of saying somebody's a Muslim? Islam, like all other ideologies and religions, has an identity, does it? All right, here's the question. Does Islam have an identity, one identity, a clear, distinct one identity? We'll talk about that. The sexual assault committed by Muslims throughout Europe must have at least something to do with Islam. Sure, but also other things. Do they not? Yes, they do. Islam is a religion that, condemns, that con commands Muslims to publicly subjugate non-Muslims and give them permission to engage in any act of violence or depiction, so to do so. What does it mean that Islam uh, commands Muslims? Does that mean it's in the Quran? Does that mean it's in the teachings? It's in the, in the shura? It's in, the, it, 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 it's in what, what um, the, uh, the mullahs preach? What, what is all that? What does it mean that Islam commands? How do you know what Islam commands? You read Arabic fluently? Do you, do you, do you listen to, to what is said in the mosques? Um, you read the Quran. Okay, we can, we'll talk about the relation between the Quran and Islam. I think that's an interesting relationship, but is it a one-on-one -on -one relationship? Is Islam the Quran? Um, gives them permission to engage in any act of violence or deception, or, or deception to do so, including sexual assault. The Quran itself even sanctions sexual slavery of non-Muslims, for God's sake. So does the Old Testament, but we will get to that. This makes crimes by Muslims against non-Muslims different in kind than regular sexual crimes. Maybe, maybe not. They are different because their purpose is different. How do you know that? How do you know what their purpose is? It depends what motivates the perpetrators, and do we know what motivates the perpetrators? Demonize, uh, demoralization followed by ultimate subjugation of non-Muslim peoples to Islam. Maybe, maybe that's the purpose, but... Right? You've, got, you've, got, you've got a lot of work to prove that one. These could even possibly be considered as acts of war or terrorism. They could be, but again, you, the burden of proof is to prove that. You mentioned secular Muslims as an example of nice, friendly Muslims. 
Why you do not give a definition of what you would mean by this term, I will assume you mean some variant of, of a person who calls themselves Muslim but does not actually believe or practice the religion of Islam. Such people exist, of course. Such people are not, however, beyond judgment, as you claim. I never claim anybody is beyond judgment. Never mind people like that. I never use the word that people are beyond judgment. That's not in my vocabulary. Uh, we cannot judge them to be possible terrorists, but we can judge them for not having enough moral courage to renounce a vicious ideology that is at war with the West. True. To not denounce Islam in today's world, especially if you don't even believe in it, is immoral. Uh, and, well, you have to be careful in what you call immoral and what isn't immoral. Immoral requires evasion. It requires a certain understanding of the world. It's not obvious to me that everybody, as you put it, who doesn't denounce Islam is immoral. And only functions to aid and abet the devout Muslims by giving Islam the veneer of respectability. That's all true. This aiding and abetting is evidence in the fact, all true, and by the way, I've said a thousand times, this aiding and abetting is evidence in the fact that people continue to support Islamic immigration by pointing to those dishonest Muslims who are not really Muslims, all right? And yet, the existence of secular Muslims does nothing to change the, exist the existence of devout ones. Of course not. And we know that as long as there is a Muslim immigration, there will always be a certain percentage that put the Quran first. A very large percentage, way over 50%. Again, proof, you have to prove that, that it's way over 50%. Uh, that, that put the Quran first, or your interpretation of the Quran, or a literal uh, American interpretation of the Quran, uh, over 50%. Uh, it's, it, the high, number's high, I don't think it's 50%. Aggregate predictions like this are valid. I've not heard you discuss any of this, acknowledge it. That's absolutely not true. I discuss it, it's on my panels with Daniel Pipes, it's in my talks in the past, it's in my history lessons, it's in all of this stuff has been, and, and by the way, I've, I've I've, uh, I've talked about Islamic immigration over and over again. I've actually supported a complete ban on Muslim immigration from the United States and from Europe. Again, you guys don't listen to actually what I say. You disagree with me and it shuts you off from what actually is being said. Okay, so here are the two questions, he says. On what basis do you claim that when judging someone, we should not be wary and not take into account the fact that they are Muslim? When have I ever, ever, ever said that. I want you to give me a quote, an actual quote, what I said. When judging someone, we should not be wary and not take into account the fact that they are Muslim. I don't believe I ever said that. I mean, I'm open to being shown that I was wrong, that I said it in some moment of insanity, but why would I say it? I, I, I mean, replace Muslim with Christian, replace Muslim with Jewish, replace Muslim with Marxist, replace Muslim with atheist. Oh, well, atheist, I wouldn't be wary. A placed Muslim with leftist. I, you know, if somebody declared themselves Jewish, I'm a little wary. If somebody declared himself a Christian, I'm a little wary. Of course, if somebody declares themselves a Muslim, I'm wary. And I'm not making a moral equivocation between all those two. I'm just saying, you, you're stating, you, you took the time to write this long statement, so I take it that what you say you mean, I'd never say something like that, if this is true. How can we ever judge anybody for upholding ideas at all? Of course. That's right. <laughs> but I never said it. Okay, if the sexual crimes committed by the UK gang rapes has something to do with Islam after all, then what possible moral justification can you give for allowing one more Muslim to immigrate to the UK? We'll get to that and what is one more Muslim and who is this Muslim and what kind of Muslim is he uh, to the UK? I say the safety of girls and women in the West is a value that completely overrides any alleged right of Muslims to cross a border and come from. I, I agree, and that's why I'm for banning all Catholic, particularly Catholic priests, from immigrating into the United States because the, the, the safety of boys in this case and, uh, and, uh, and girls in the West is more valuable than the right of priests. And, and I, would shut down, I would shut down the Catholic Church, take the Vatican away from them, and, uh, and announce that Catholicism and the Catholic Church is closed for business. Right. I might also ask if the attacks of 9-11 had something to do with Islam, what possible moral justification could give for allowing Muslims to immigrate to the United States. All right. <laughs> That's a lot, right? And I know a lot of people have these questions because I see, I see people uh, going after me constantly on Facebook uh, about these issues, misrepresenting my points of view. I think, I think actually... Um, uh, 
I think Jason has misrepresented them less than what they usually misrepresented, so I give him credit at least for that. But a lot of his formulations about what I say are just not true, so I would challenge anybody to, to quote me, to actually quote me, um, uh, you know, what that means, all right? Um, yes, I know, uh, so Jason says, global average of Muslims who believe the Quran is literally true is 70 to 90% range. I know, I've seen those statistics. But then ask them, what does the Quran mean? What does the Quran actually say? Does their interpretation of the Quran agree with your interpretation of the Quran? If you asked Muslims around the world, if in their view it was okay to sexually molest non-Muslim girls, and that the Quran says that, whether the Quran says that, I am willing to guarantee that the number is not 70 to 90 percent. I, I didn't bring up my uh, survey statistics on uh, the Muslim world. But it's interesting, yes, they, they know they're supposed to say that the Quran is literally true. I mean, a lot of evangelical Christians believe that the Old and New Testament are all literally true. How many of them understand what the Old and New Testament actually say? How many of them uh, would say, yes, that's true if you actually position, proposition something from those books to them? Um, again, don't simplify. Don't simplify. Think carefully about what it is you're saying, right? Think carefully about what it is that they are actually advocating. Think what it is for a Muslim in, um, in Bangladesh to say, no, I don't think the Quran is absolutely true. Well, I mean, I, I can tell you what happens to Muslims like that in Bangladesh. They get, some of them find themselves dead. So beware, beware. Um, yeah, uh, Sage says, I'm Lebanese, I would never visit Lebanon as a cesspool. Sure, but it wasn't a cesspool in the 60s. I would have gone to Lebanon in the 60s. I, would have, I wouldn't have mind being in Beirut in the 1960s. Yeah, it's a cesspool, and there's a reason it's a cesspool. All right, we're going to back off of all the comments, and we're going to take this step by step. And again, you want to ask a question, super chat it. Uh, and, um, and we'll see where we get to. Okay, let's talk about what is Islam, which relates to this question about the Quran. And this is true of what? Of any religion. What is Christianity? What is Judaism? Is Judaism one thing? If somebody says to you, I am a Jew, what ideologically do you know about him? Now, we'll get to Islam. Islam is a little different, granted, but, but I want to make a certain point here. What do you know about him, even qua his religious beliefs? If somebody says to you, I'm a Jew, how much about his religious beliefs do you know? Not much. For example, is he a Reformed Jew, a Conservative Jew, an Orthodox Jew, an Ultra-Orthodox Jew? The differences just between those four is vast in terms of how they interpret what it means to be a Jew, what commandments they follow and what commandments they don't follow. It is a huge difference in how they live their lives, how they interact with other people. And what it meant to be a Jew 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, is different than what it means to be, or in Israel, is very different than what it means to be a Jew in America today. My grandfather, who was not an Orthodox Jew, was more of a conservative Jew, which is more mild and more moderate than an Orthodox Jew, you know. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm putting aside the idea of a, a cultural Jew. We're just talking about a religious, from a religious perspective, forget about cultural. Right? There are lots of cultural Jews who are atheists. But from a religious perspective, take religious Jews. What does it mean? My grandfather was a religious Jew, a conservative, but a conservative, not an orthodox, an ultra-orthodox. In spite of that, when his sons married non-Jewish women, he wrote them off, never spoke to them again, and, you know, until luckily a few months before he died, he talked to them again and reconciled with them. But he took his tribe really, really seriously. I think barbarically, stupidly, ridiculously. Right? Ultra-Orthodox Jews, the ones who wear black and wear their funny hair and, and walk around um, uh, Brooklyn, are barbaric in many of their customs. And in the way they treat women, certainly. You know, those Jews, every morning they wake up, the first prayer out of their mouth is, Baruch Shalom Asa'ini Isha. Thank God you didn't make me a woman. 
talk about sexism, me too. All right, what kind of a, what kind of a, um, um, <laughs> what kind of a religion is that? So uh, are we going to paint all Jews as sexists? And by the way, if you gave political power to the ultra-Orthodox Jews, beware. I guess none of you have ever been on the other side of a rock barrage launched at you by ultra-Orthodox Jews because you did drive on a Saturday through the streets of Jerusalem or in my dad's case, through the streets of Haifa because he was a doctor on duty going to the hospital and got rocks thrown at his car. Right? Give those people political power? Forget about freedom. Forget about freedom. Now, because there are Jews like that, who, by the way, are moderate as compared to the Jews of the Old Testament, where God tells the Jews to take on little girls as sex slaves, where God tells the Jews to wipe whole people out, women, children, and beasts, so not a seed among them will remain. So, right, listen, Jason, instead of commenting, listen, right? So what does it mean when somebody says a Jew? What does it mean when somebody says, I'm a Christian? There are a hundred different sects. Are they Catholic? Are they Protestant? Which Protestant? Which Evangelical? Even the Evangelicals don't agree. They have completely different politics. They have completely different attitudes to environmentalism, to a lot of different things. So what does it mean when somebody affiliates, is associated with a particular religion? Now, all of the religions are irrational, quite rational. It's all immoral. It's all in a, in a 21st century to be religious, particularly in the West, requires an act of evasion. It requires to evade. But what does it mean, right? An objectivist, at least because I think partially because the philosophy is young, but also, you know, this is why, this is a, this is a good point. This is why Ayn Rand was so insistent that you only refer to objectivism to what she wrote. Because she didn't want multiple sects of objectivism one day. What I'm arguing right now is not objectivism. It's, to the best of my knowledge, the, the application of objectivism to this issue. But it's not objectivism. Because Ayn Rand didn't write about this issue. That, only what Ayn Rand wrote, is objectivism. Because she didn't want multiple cults of objectivism, multiple groups of objectivism, multiple whatever of objectivism, denominations of objectivism. So when we talk about objectivism, it's a set thing. I mean, even Marxism, it's hard to tell. I mean, warning signs go off, certainly. But it depends on what kind of Marxist. And people today throw it around because it's sexy, which is horrible, right? Young people do. But yeah, you judge people based on the ideas that they hold. You certainly judge them, particularly older people. But what are those ideas? Can you just get those ideas from a label? Can you understand them? Can you grasp them? Do you know what they actually stand for just from a label? I want to know more if I'm going to judge a person. I want to know what it means to them, particularly when they're young. And particularly if it's something ambiguous, like I'm a Jew, I'm a Christian, I'm a Muslim. Now, again, all of that is irrational. All of that, particularly in the West, is immoral. But are they an enemy? Are they a threat? Is there somebody I should worry about? I need to know a lot more than just if they're Muslim, if that's the case. Now again, we'll get to immigration, I promise. I will answer your question, Jason, although I have already answered that question. That's why it's funny that you're asking a super chat question on something that while I was reading your statement actually said, I addressed this. And you know, that's why I said, listen, people don't listen. It drives me nuts. So I don't know what Islam is. Islam is a religion based on a Quran, based on the teachings of Muhammad, which has certain principles. They pray five times a day. Mecca and Medina are important to them. You know, you, as an adult, you, you have to go there once. And there's a, a bunch of other prescriptions that involved with Islam. But then there are about a thousand different interpretations of every single line in the in the Quran, there are multiple schools of interpretations of the Quran. 
that wrote after the publication of the Quran. The, 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 the Ottomans did not practice Islam like the, like the uh, original Arabs did, and, the, and it, the, the, the Iranians never practiced it exactly like the Arabs or the Ottomans, and the Shiites and the Sunnis are different. And they all interpret that one book, that one book differently. Just like there are sects, Protestant sects, there are schools within Islam with leaders, with teachers, with philosophers. Haven't been philosophers around in a long time. They used to be. There are different schools of Islam. There's a massive university in Egypt, which is a school of Islam. But the Muslim Brotherhood thinks that they are apostates because their interpretation of Islam, according to the Muslim Brotherhood, is wrong. So do you evaluate all Muslims based on the interpretation of the Muslim Brotherhood? Or do you interpret all Muslims based on Al-Qaeda's interpretation? Or do you evaluate all Muslims based on your interpretation? I don't evaluate Muslims based on my interpretation of Islam. I evaluate Muslims based on their interpretation of Islam. I do not treat, I do not treat a Muslim a, a, a regular Joe Muslim from Egypt who hated the Muslim Brotherhood and will ha has nothing to do with the Muslim Brotherhood, but prays five times a day facing Mecca. I don't, I don't judge him the same as I judge a Muslim Brotherhood. I don't judge him the same as I judge Al-Qaeda. I don't judge him the same as I judge Wahhabi. He says, but the disagreements are not relevant because they all agree that non-Muslims should be subjugated. Not true. Just absolutely not true. Many of the priests, uh, uh, preachers in, uh, in, in, uh, in, the, in the school, the, the, the largest school in Islamic uh, teaching in, uh, in, in the world, in Cairo, don't think that all non-Muslims should be subjugated. The Muslims that I... Now, one of the things that makes me different than a lot of you guys, I think, is that I grew up with Muslims. Half my class at the university were Arabs. About half of them were Muslims and half of them were Christians. Many of them were girls in engineering school. Most of the people who worked for me when I was an engineer in Israel were Arabs, Muslims. Many of them Palestinians from the West Bank. I've eaten in their homes. I've traded with them. I've done business with them. I've fought well, I haven't fought, I fought against them, but I, I fought against them. I've actually been in war with Muslims, right? Killed them. But I've also had Muslims in my tent during basic training. Because some Muslims, Muslims who, who pray five times a day, facing Mecca and Medina, actually fighting the Israeli army, not many, but there are a few. So what do you make of them? What do you make of the fact that the lead FBI investigator, one of the lead FBI investigators, trying to catch the, 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 the Al-Qaeda's, uh, Al-Qaeda before 9-11, trying to catch them, investigating in Yemen and investigating Al-Qaeda, is a practicing Muslim. Does he want to subjugate all non-Muslims? No, he doesn't. He wants to live in America, and he wants to pray, and he finds some solace in his religion. Now, do I think that's stupid? Do I think that's irrational? Yes. Do I think he should be kicked out of the country as an enemy of the United States? No. Does I think that because he prays five times a day and because he reads the Quran and knows it really well, because they learn it by heart, do I think that is an act of treason against the United States, which is what you're implying? No. Context. Context is everything. So you can't make generalized statements like that. And you can't just take a survey and say, by the survey, I can judge everybody who claims to be a Muslim that he wants to subjugate me. Now, again, I haven't said, I said something about uh, immigration. We'll get to that in a minute. So none of this is to imply that I support mass immigration into Europe, because I know somebody will listen to the first 10 minutes of this and say, oh, Yuan loves Muslims, he, you know, because that's, that's how people who listen to this. How do you know that he doesn't want Islam to eventually replace our political system? How do you know? How I know about everything? I ask him. Now, he could be lying, but anybody could be lying. And I don't take any more than I take an ultra-Orthodox Jew wearing the black stuff as, as necessarily. Now, them, I'm wary of because they are ultra-Orthodox and they, they, they wear it on their clothing. They tell us exactly what they want to do to us. This would be like Al-Qaeda wearing special clothes. 
But I, 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 don't, I don't immediately assume every evangelical wants a theocracy, although some of them do. I don't assume that every Muslim wants to eventually replace my political system. I mean, I know Muslims who vote Republican. I know Muslims who vote Democrat. I know, I know former Muslims because one of the guys who hounds me on Facebook claims that Muslims are beyond fixing. So, you, so there's no point ever talking to one because they're always Muslims. And I know Muslims, former Muslims, who are objectivists. I mean, one of them has flown in now twice to, to, uh, to Okan from, um, from Dubai. Uh, a number of them have, have become atheists, partially because Ayn Rand, and, and came to Opa. There's a Muhammad who's an objectivist. Um, I mean, it's the, the whole attitude of this is another species that, that is irredeemable is, is bizarre. I take them at their word, and I watch them. Is there any evidence to suggest that the, I don't know, two to three million Muslims in the United States want to replace the U.S. government with a caliphate with a with with Sharia law, no. And if you actually if you actually go and do surveys, what you'll see is in America, as compared to Europe, they assimilate fast. They might come here with all kind of primitive, barbaric ideas, and those ideas very quickly, very quickly, dissipate and go away. That they become much more secular. That they become much more American, as time goes on. Just like everything else, America assimilates them. And there have always been questions about these things. Look, there was a huge campaign about JFK. Don't elect JFK because his real alliance, allegiance, not alliance, his real allegiance is to the Pope. It's to the Catholic Church, not to America. Now think about that. Today, we would never say, oh, if you're Catholic, you can't become president because what you really care. But wait, when a Jew runs for presidency, they will say we can't elect a Jew because the real allegiance is to Israel, not to America. That's what the anti-Semites will say. But we've always had this because, yeah, it's complicated to figure out what role religion plays in an individual's life, in an individual's mind. And not in every individual does religion play the same role. The more important religion plays in that individual's mind, the more we shouldn't trust them, the more we should be wary of them. And certainly, if they're Muslim, we should be extremely wary of them if they become more and more and more religious, especially if the manifestation of that religion is towards uh, kind of the Muslim Brotherhood interpretation, towards an Islamist interpretation. There's a, there's a whole interpretation of Islam, by the way, the uh, Sufism, I think it's called, right? Where it's all mystical. And they're very Eastern in that sense, a little bit like Buddhists. And it's all about meditation. And it's all about, ah, this, this real world is meaningless. Leave it alone. Well, you see, but this is, this is, Jason, think. Most Nazis would not actually kill Jews either. It's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. Nazism is one form of a, you know, Nazism is, a, is equivalent to Islamists. Nazism is not equivalent to Islam. There are no moderate Nazis. They are moderate Muslims because of the way they interpret the Quran or the way they, they, they do the Quran. You can be a moderate Nazi. Nazism is explicit and it's represented by a particular political party, by a particular political head that manifests itself in the world in a particular way. You cannot equate the two. It is stupid. Not stupid. It is unthinking. You can equate Islamism with Nazism. Because Islamism is that particular interpretation of Islam which dominates. And that's why I consider the Iranian regime close to a Nazi regime. And members who support the Iranian regime as people equivalent to those who support the Nazi regime. Because it is a theocracy, because it is driven by Sharia law, because it is completely, completely a, a sub-ideology within, within Islam. Yeah, the Nazis 
who, that's right, the Nazis who want to be away from Jews but don't believe in killing them. That's right, that's why I don't believe in, um, in what? In arresting all Nazis. I do believe, I don't believe in monitoring all Nazis, right? Because I think most of them are just a bunch of idiots who don't even know what they're talking about, right? right? They're, they're all anti-Semites, but okay. So if they're, if they're Nazis today, I, I was thinking you were talking about Nazis in Germany. If they're Nazis today, yeah, there's a Nazi, the Nazis marches all over the place, okay? We don't stop them, right? If they start advocating for killing Jews, you put them in jail. So again, Islam is not one ideology. There are vast differences, and somebody saying they're Muslim is not, or practicing some subset, some subset of that ideology does not make them a threat. Now we'll get, we'll get to the fact that we're at war and what do you do when we're at war because there's a certain sense in which it's not our job to differentiate. And I accept that and we'll get to that. But first, listen to what I have to say. So you have to, you can't evaluate all Muslims the same. You just can't. You can't evaluate Bin Laden as the same as the guy who did construction for me, who yes, he prayed, but he loved Jews. He loved doing business with Jews. And he didn't want any political power. He just wanted to make a living and go home and, and put food on the table for his wife and kids. And he wanted to basically be left alone. And he prayed five times a day. And he didn't join PLO and he didn't join Hamas. And he, and he isn't going to blow himself up because he likes his life too much to blow himself up in a suicide bombing. You don't equate the two the same. Now, this is the problem, and this is where I have sympathies towards Jason and people who agree with Jason. They're at war with us. And I say they're at war with us purposefully because I don't think we're at war with them, but they're at war with us. So do you believe a proper definition of Islam can be given? No, not, there isn't a definition of Islam um, that Islam is the religion of those who believe in Muhammad and the Quran, something like that. It's a very, very broad definition. How do you define Christianity? I don't know, something like those who believe that uh, Jesus was the son of God and in the, the New Testament is, is, is the word of whatever, of God or whatever. I, I don't even know if that's an accurate definition of Christianity. I have to think about it. Well, but what... what no, I don't think the Quran, what it says, what you think it says, is relevant. What's relevant is how people interpret it, how people actually apply it. That's what's relevant. Any more than the, new, the Old Testament is not, relevant, is not relevant to how I treat Jews. Because if I believed that every Jew was going to act based on what was said in the Old Testament then I would want to ban any association from any Jews. Because the Old Testament is as brutal, if not more brutal, than the Quran. And the Jews are commanded to do things that are as horrific, as disgusting as what Muhammad does in the Quran. Not all Christians believe in original sin. Not all Christians have the same interpretation of original sin. That's why there are millions of sects of Christianity, because they don't all agree on almost anything. And Jews, no two rabbis agree on what the Old Testament says. So yes, there's a framework in which you can understand them, and it's important. And the fact that they all believe in God, they all believe in a book, makes them all irrational, and you can judge them qua that. But in terms of actually engaging with them, actually figuring out what to do with this, what to do with them, you can't just say, because you're a Christian, this is what you are. I, I, I've met Christians who say they don't believe in original sin, but they think they're Christians. I mean, I, I, this is the point I've made a thousand times. I'm not a theologian. I don't try to tell other people what their religion means. I let them tell me what it means to them. And I judge them based on that. And if it means to them the subjugation of all non-Muslims, then they're my enemy, and I want to try to shoot them before they shoot me. 
if they tell me, yeah, I believe Muhammad, he was pro-peace, you know, they ignore all the stuff, that was just wartime, that's not what it's like today, and I want to be an American, I love America, I believe in free speech, I believe in separation of church and state, you know, I think they're irrational because they believe in, in, in Muhammad and the Quran, but if they believe in the separation of church and state, they don't subjugate me, hey, I could be friendly with such a person. Yeah. Details matter. Details matter. Well, those people don't matter. What does that even mean? Right? That's a collectivistic statement. If you meet a Muslim, that person does matter. And how you interact with that person matters. And when it comes to immigration, it matters. If you let people in, who you're letting in. All right. This is the context, though. This is what makes this complicated, because in a, in a free world, in, uh, in a world which we were not at war, I don't think we'd be debating this. But we're at war. A certain faction within Islam has declared war on us. They want to kill us. They want to subjugate us. They want to rape our women. They want to pillage our towns. They want to destroy Western civilization. There is no question about that. And I was one of the first to say so after 9-11. Today, everybody gets it, but nobody got it back then. I was one of the first to say, we're not fighting terrorism, we're fighting Islamic totalitarianism, we're fighting a certain interpretation of Islam, a certain interpretation of the Quran. A subset of Muslims want to destroy us and we need to crush them first. And that's the context in which this becomes a problem. And look, anyway, that's the context. They attacked us. They attacked us in 9-11, clearly, but they were attacking us before. They've really been attacking us since 1979 and, uh, it, when our embassy was taken by Ayatollah Khomeini and his thugs in Iran when the first new Islamic totalitarian regime was established. It inspired uh, Islamic totalitarian uh, groups and uh, organizations all over the world. And since then, they've been at war with us. An explicit war. Now, Jason says they've been at war with us since the 8th century. Please, don't pretend I don't know history, right? Give me a break, right? Um, Go back and listen to my history of the Middle East, right? Go back to listen to my history of totalitarian Islam. There's a very big difference. So here we are, and we're at war with this group. This group wants to kill us, wants to subjugate us. And our leaders refuse to acknowledge that fact. Our leaders across the West, in the United States, George Bush and everybody else, refuse to acknowledge the fact that we're at war, refuse to acknowledge the fact that there is an enemy, refuse to acknowledge the fact that this enemy is linked to Islam, that it's inspired by the Quran, that it's inspired by Islamic teachings. And as a consequence, we go after a secular leader in Iran. We go after, you know, we don't do anything really in, in uh, Afghanistan. We're still there in spite of, the, in spite of uh, Trump increasing troops. We continue to lose in Afghanistan. Americans keep, to keep dying in Afghanistan for nothing. We treat Af uh, Saudi Arabia, one of the fountainheads of the Islamist movement, as a friend. We do nothing about Iran, sanctions or something. And we pretend there's no problem. We allow a million immigrants into Europe, a million Muslim immigrants into Europe, without any screening, without any question, without any doubt. From a region where we know that at least a certain percentage of them are real nuts, are real Islamists, want to destroy the West. So the challenge we face today, challenge I face today as a commentator, is that the solution to the problem of the fact that we're at war with Islamists is to go to war with Islamists, to go to war with the jihadis, to kill them, to crush them, to destroy their infrastructure, to devastate 
the, 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 the source of their funding, of their weapons, of the ideology. Crush the Saudis, crush the Iranians, and this all goes away. It all goes away because people don't fight for losing ideology. It all goes away because nobody's funding their religious schools all over the world. It all goes away because the mosques in Europe and in Asia and everywhere else don't have the money to keep on preaching the hatred that they preach. It all goes away because the Wahhabi ideology is dead. It's finished. It all goes away because everybody looks at America and says, whoa, these guys are serious. These guys are willing to defend themselves. These guys actually stand for something. And the Muslim world would actually look at us and say, we want to be like them. We're willing to shrug off Islam, or at least this interpretation of Islam, and become more like them. And there are plenty of historical precedent for this happening. But right now, we're weak. We're pathetic. We won't even acknowledge that there's a war. We certainly won't fight it. We won't kill anybody, God forbid, without our lawyer's approval. We can't waterboard people. Right? We're terrorists who want to kill us. We have to treat them as if they're what? Saints. So we're in this, or I'm, some of us are in this impossible situation. I know what should be done. I know how to win this war. I know how you do it, but nobody's doing it. So what you want, what everybody else is saying is, and, and by the way, everything else to me is secondary. Immigration is secondary. Assimilation is secondary. Everything to do with Islam and Muslims and jihadis is secondary to defeating them, to crushing them, to eliminating the threat. Because after you eliminate the threat, everything else is, is your attitude towards it changes. And even when it comes to physical, physically defending America, banning Islamic immigration is not going to safeguard us. If they really want to hurt us, they will find ways to hurt us. I don't know. Um, I mean, it's just a side story, but, but this is a true story. I just read about it. Uh, a couple of Americans um, biking in, um, around the world. They went on a bike around the world. And, you know, they were treated well everywhere they went, in, in, and they were riding through the, the, the stands in Central Asia, and, and mostly they were treated very nicely by Muslims in these stands. But then they were noticed by a group of young men, uh, and they noticed they were Americans, and so the, the, they purposely took their van, um, turned around, and rammed into the bicycles and killed four, four bicycle riders, two of them Americans. Yeah, they're going to kill us, particularly if they think they can get away with it, particularly if the American government, that was in Tajikistan, particularly if they can get away with it, particularly if the American government won't defend us, particularly if the American government won't penalize those who kill Americans, particularly if the American government does nothing about Iran, does nothing about Saudi Arabia, these people feel emboldened. They can get away with anything, and they do. So, you know, so if we don't go to war, then every other solution, every other remedy is, is in my view, half-assed. So, is Islam immoral? Yes. It's religion. Faith is immoral. Is every Muslim evil? No. Some Muslims are evil. Those who advocate for violence, those who believe that violence is the way to spread ideas, those who believe in subjugation of non-Muslims, those who believe who can treat women any way they want and can rape them, they are evil. There are plenty of Muslims who don't believe that. I mean, you know, I don't know what the numbers are, but uh, you can go You can go to, uh, yes, faith is immoral. Uh, in the world in which we live in today, in the 21st century, yeah. Um, you can go to... Uh, you can go to Malaysia and you can go to Indonesia. You can go to uh, places where there are relatively secular Muslims. Palestinians used to be quite secular um, and quite educated, quite secular. Egyptians used to be quite secular and quite, quite educated. Unfortunately, they've turned away from that. They've all adopted more, not all, but a significant number of them have become more jihadi over time because of the weakness of the West and because of the weakness, our, our, our inability to defend our own values. So let's talk about immigration. Now, I've said, I don't know, at 
least five times. I can probably document them all. First time I remember saying it was in my debate with Leonard Peikoff. He asked me straight out, would you ban all Muslim immigration to the United States? And I said, yes. I've said I would ban Muslim immigration to Europe several times, as long as we're at war. I wouldn't ban it forever, but as long as we're at war and we haven't won it, you don't let the enemy in. And it's hard to tell who the enemy is and who the enemy isn't. I grant you that. Now, if you could evaluate the Muslims and tell these guys are jihadis, these guys are not, I would let in the ones who are not jihadi. I mean, where you draw the line, I would, I would be very, very conservative. I would, I would tend to say no because we're at war. And that goes back to your, to your Nazi question, right? During World War II, you don't allow Germans into the U.S. unless the German can prove that they're not a Nazi or Nazi sympathizer. Okay, if you're not, you can come in. So yeah, I, I, you know, if a million Muslims start walking and entering Europe, you can't screen them. So don't let them in. And if you're gonna let them in, screen them. And if you're gonna, I was, I was even for when Donald Trump uh, did his uh, what do you call it, uh, a Muslim uh, the ban on certain countries, and he was gonna do intensive screening or what do they? There was a term for that. Um, um, more, more exaggerated sc uh, screening. Look, I mean, Jason, you're not listening to what I said. I said I advocate for banning Muslim immigration, right? I said that, not because we're not at war. I think we should be at war. I think it's a travesty we're not at war. I think that's where your energy should be. I think that's the most important thing to advocate for. I don't think immigration is that important. I don't see masses of Muslim immigrants coming to America to kill us. It's just not happening, but yeah. I'd be for stopping immigration now, even if we don't declare war, but it's much more important to declare war. And, and I don't see anybody advocating for that. You guys are so obsessed with immigration. It's such an issue for you that I don't believe you that you want to stop Muslims from immigrating to America because they're potential terrorists. You just want to ban everybody you can who comes from a non-European country from coming to America. And you've got an excuse with Muslims. So I've said like three times on this show today, I would ban Muslim immigration, and you can't even hear that. When Donald Trump passed his uh, extensive screening, what was it called? I forget what it, it wasn't extensive, it was extreme vetting. I said, absolutely. I would do extremely extreme vetting. But I said, Donald Trump is not serious. Donald Trump is a joke. Extreme vetting under Donald Trump is a joke because he excluded Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Dubai, Algeria, Morocco, Egypt, countries where actually terrorists come from. <laughs> they were excluded from extreme vetting. So I argued at the time, go listen to those shows. They're on Blog Talk Radio. They're on iTunes. I argued that if you're gonna do extreme vetting, do it for all Muslim countries, all of them, particularly those where we know terrorists have come from, like Saudi Arabia. <laughs> See, now they're shifting. They're shifting, Jason's shifting, and this is the real issue, right? They pretend this is about jihad. They pretend it's about gang rapes. They pretend it's about violence, but no, it's about culture. And that's why they don't want Mexicans. They don't want Guatemalans. They don't want Chinese. They don't want anybody who's not European. And I'm not saying he should, I'm not saying even uh, 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 Trump should have a uh, Muslim ban. He could have done an extreme vetting of all Muslim countries. At least don't be a hypocrite. At least don't, don't only do it for those countries that don't put political pressure on you and then go and dance with the king of Saudi Arabia. Yeah, that, that shows you. That shows you. Islamic culture. Yeah. All right. I, I, I'm giving up. I'm sorry, Jason, but I think I'm giving up on you because you're not listening and you can't listen, right? 
Well, I'm not explaining well. Somebody tell me if maybe I'm not explaining well. All right. So I believe Muslims, if they were extremely vetted, to exclude those who believe in uh, Sharia, in, uh, who believe in uh, wanting to change the U.S. to become, uh, to become a Muslim country, how could they do that? There are only two or three million Muslims in all of America. Um, if they came in, I would have no problem with that. I would have no problem with that if we had extremely extreme vetting on all Muslims who came in. But we don't do that. Yeah, Muslims engage in jihad to establish, to establish no, not Islamic. I don't know what Islamic culture is any more than I know what Islam is. What does Islamic culture mean? Which Islamic culture? The Islamic culture of the golden age of Islam? The Islamic culture of Iran during the Shah? The Islamic culture of Egypt during the king? During Nasser? During the Muslim Brotherhood? Is it even Islamic culture? Is it Arab culture? Is it that big of a difference culturally between the Muslims and the Arabs, between the Muslims and the Christians in the same country? The golden age of Islam was bad. All right. Um, bad relative to what? I'll take it over. I'll take it over the dark or middle ages of Christianity any day. And in some ways, in terms of respect for ideas, I take it over, uh, you know, many periods in human history. It means Islamic theocracy. So if, if they advocate for Islamic theocracy, it's easy, right? They're enemies. They're part of the enemy. It's a war. You don't let the enemy in. That's easy. But you're not going to do that. Nothing's going to happen until you declare war. So stop obsessing about immigration. Start obsessing about the need to go to war. Assimilation. I believe Muslims can assimilate. I see no proof that they can't. In America, all the statistics show that they assimilate quite well. They don't assimilate at much of a slower rate than other groups assimilate. I, so I have no problem in a free society for immigration. Again, as long as they're not the enemy. As long as we've defeated the enemy, we've crushed the enemy, we pacified the enemy. So, no, it's, it's, it's not natural to want to be with your own when you mean your own, your skin color, and your genetic makeup. That is disgusting. That sense of your own is a disgusting notion. And it's a racist notion, and it doesn't belong on my on my wall. The, <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, as I said, I think there are lots of different types of Muslims. There are certain Muslims that have to be killed. There are certain Muslims that have to be excluded from all civilized activity. And there are other Muslims that one would embrace just like what it would embrace Jews and Christians. Um, and to lump them all in together is, is collectivism. It's, it's, to, it's to take away the essentials of what it means to judge. You judge a human being. Islam in its Islamist, jihadist manifestation is the epitome of evil. The Islam practiced by a lot of Muslims I know and have met and have been in their homes is not. By the way, Robert Spencer is somebody that I've been on stage with, that I've discussed ideas with. Uh, I think he's wrong on certain things. I think he is an authority. He's not as much of an authority in Islam as he thinks he is. Um, he's a good Catholic boy. And uh, he's wrong. He's wrong about many things about Islam. Um, so let's go to the gang rapes. Because I find it interesting, again, that while people are saying Everything about the gang rapes is caused by Islam. I don't see anybody saying, or very few people saying, everything about the child molestation by priests is about Catholicism. Why not? Not only that, in many ways, 
the, 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 what's going on in the Catholic Church is worse, much worse, much worse than, I mean, it's, it's horrific to compare, but right, why is it worse? In terms of the affiliation with religion, these are priests. These are representatives of the religion. These are people people trust because of their affiliation with the religion. The, the, the gang rapists in, uh, in England are just, are just horrible, barbaric, subhuman people. They come from horrific, backward, primitive cultures. Inspired, they, they, get, they rationalize. They use Islam to rationalize their behavior. It's not that they are reading the Quran and saying, oh, I could go some rape some girls, and they go rape girls. No, they rape girls, and they said, yeah, I remember there's a passage in the Quran that justifies this, and that's how they rationalize it to themselves. These are evil, horrible, disgusting people who come from a culture where this is tolerated, and that culture is a Pakistani culture. Again, I'm not painting all Pakistanis like this, but there's a subculture within Pakistan where this is allowed, expected, and it's legitimized through religion. With the priests, they're the religious practitioners. They're the people representing the religion in their world. The Catholic priests do it in opposition to their religion, really? Is, is Catholicism not a religion that you can, you can say you're sorry and everything is okay? Is it not a religion that sanctions to the, to the church behaviors that us commoners do not, are not allowed to have? Is it not a religion that forever, forever, the popes and the cardinals have behaved like monsters and have never been held accountable for their behavior? Catholicism, Catholicism has institutionalized this. You don't get 301 cases, separate priests in one state if this is not part of the religion. So it's not written in the book, but it's sanctioned by the person who talks to God, the Pope. So it's, oh, that's not part of the religion, but it says in the Quran, it says in the Old Testament, you know, the Jews, the, uh, 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 Joshua tells the Jews, go kill everybody, every man, woman, and child. And the soldiers come back and they've got children. They brought back the children. And Joshua says, what are you doing? I told, you to, I told you to kill them all. God said to kill them all. And, and the Jews said, yeah, well, we couldn't kill the kids. So he said, okay, kill all the boys. You have to kill the boys. The girls you can take and make into sex slaves. Fine. God has no problem with that. No problem with that. Sex slaves are not a problem in Judaism. So... Do you see Jewish pedophiles? I'm sure there's some Jewish pedophiles who use that as an excuse. I know some pedophiles that say, hey, um, Plato and Aristotle slept with young boys. I'm sorry, I, I, I can't differentiate. I, I actually am much more pissed off about the, the Catholics than I am about the Muslims because not that I justify anything. I mean, I, you know, I'm, they should all hang. They should all be, 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 be uh, uh, you know, they should all, I mean, I, I, I believe that rapists should get the, the life in prison, throw away the keys, live on bread and water. Bread and water. But priests are educated they are sophisticated people, supposedly. Yeah, these Muslims are barbarians. Yes, it's horrific. And what really made it possible was the police turning a blind eye. That's what made it grow to the extent that it did. But the police turning a blind eye again is horrific. That's who I blame. This, that's what I think is the most horrific thing, is the police turning a blind eye. But in the Catholic Church, it was the Pope, the man who speaks to God, turning a blind eye.
Islam treats women as second-class citizens. So does ultra-Orthodox Jews. So does some, you know, cults within Christianity. So does some sections within the Mormon church. It's sad. It's horrible. It's immoral. It's evil. It's bad. If it gets to the point where rights are being violated, it's the job of the government to go in and protect the women, no matter what the religion is. But, you know... <laughs> Your reading of the Quran, your interpretation of the Quran, your understanding of the Quran means absolutely nothing. It's their interpretation of the Quran that means everything. And if some people don't interpret the Quran as, as uh, allowing for raping children, then what are you going to do about that? Are you going to say you're right and they're wrong? They're not real Muslims? You're, you understand what, what their traditions are? Maybe, I mean, okay, if you want to be a theologian, I'm not. <laughs> right? And, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying the Jews, it's, a, it's approved for Jews to rape little girls because there were a lot of commentators in the Talmud and everywhere who say, no, it's not okay. Just like there were a lot of uh, mullahs and uh, priests in Islam who said, no, it's not okay to rape children. But you haven't read those. Just like most people have not read the Talmud. Now, Islam is the most primitive of all religions. It's the most barbaric of all religions. It's the most backwards of all religions because they never had an enlightenment. They never went through a, rena they went through a renaissance, but then it never developed beyond that. They actually succumbed as a civilization. It collapsed back into barbarism. But that doesn't mean that every Muslim is a barbarian. It doesn't mean that they're not capable of rising above that. It means that, yeah, you should be suspicious of somebody who's a Muslim. But you should be then questioning what kind of a Muslim they are. And if they're kind, and they're all kinds of Muslims. That was my point. So if you want to know what Islam is, how do you know what Christianity is? I, I, that's what I said. I said, I, I, I can't judge a person based just on the fact that he says he's a Christian, because I don't know what kind of a Christian he is. I'm fine with quoting the Quran. Man, I'm either a really bad teacher, <laughs> or people don't listen. If somebody says the Quran, if I ask somebody, what do you take Islam to be? And they say, I take Islam to be, every word in the Quran is true, and raping little girls is good. Then they deserve a bullet in their forehead. I mean, the equivalent of. They don't deserve, they, they're evil. If somebody says to me, I'm a Muslim, and I follow the teaching of, uh, I don't know, Islamic this and that, I don't believe that every word in the Quran as literal, should be taken literally. I think that the teachings of the Hadith and the teaching of this and the teaching of that show that Islam is actually... Uh, there's an interpretation of Islam that is peaceful, then fine. Then that's his version of Islam. Let him live with it. I'm not going to condemn him and tell him you can't call yourself a Muslim. Now, I do agree with you on this. Everybody who is pro-civilization should be anti-Islamist, should be condemning the jihadists, and more so than anybody, the Muslims. So if Muslims really are anti-Sharia, if Muslims really are anti-jihad, then they must speak louder than anybody else. Louder than anybody else. They should, in that sense, be held to a higher standard. A Muslim who says, well, I don't agree with them, but, you know, I'm not going to say anything against them. That's bad, and that should be morally condemned. So they should be morally condemned for not standing up against the jihadis. They should be, because it's, it's their religion. They should be the ones who fight. It's their responsibility. If they think their religion is something different than what the jihadis claim, they should be advocating for it, for that, and they should be fighting the jihadis. There should be a real war in the Muslim world between the jihadis and the so-called moderates. But I don't rule out the existence of moderates, and I don't rule out the possibility of moderates. So you judge every individual based on who he is, what ideas he 
actually holds. While you can condemn religion qua religion, you can say Islam as practiced by most Muslims is the most barbaric and primitive of all the religions out there. And I, ch I challenge you guys, I challenge you guys to go travel. Go meet some Muslims. <laughs> because I don't, think, I don't think most people know what they're talking about when they talk about Islam. Because they've never, or Muslims, because they've never met a Muslim. They, and they haven't studied. They, they, they read the Quran and they think they know everything. But, but study what Muslim thinkers have written about the Quran and how they interpret the Quran and how they think about the Quran. Not what bin Laden says. Bin Laden is one interpretation. You should know that too. But he's not the only interpretation. So as I said, I'm fine with extreme vetting. I'm a deist to agree. This is a uh, super chat. I'm a, I'm a deist to agree is overwhelming with objectivism. Nevertheless, I would be interested in to hear what objectivism argument against deism is. Well, you don't have an argument against deism, right? I don't have an argument against God because God is a meaningless... What does deism mean? It doesn't mean anything. How can I argue against something that's meaningless? It's arbitrary. Does deism mean what? You believe in God. What is God? Define God. Show me evidence of God's existence, and then I'll argue against that evidence. But if you can't show me evidence, then there's nothing to argue about. The arbitrary is non-cognitive. It has no standing. It's not something to be argued against. It's arbitrary. So you saying you're a deist is epistemologically equivalent to me saying there's a gremlin under your chair. He's an invisible gremlin. You can't see him. I can't see him either. But I know he's there because I just know it. You can't, even, you can't argue with that. What are you going to say to me? No, no, I, I can't see him. You know. It was funny. I was at a conference, and uh, this, this uh, Christian spoke before me. It was not easy to speak after him. Um, he, and he associated everything good in America with Christianity, capitalism with Christianity, everything was Christian. And he said, this was his proof of God, right? He said... Um, he said, you know, people, he said, I, I've heard this story once, and I think the story's brilliant, he says to me. He says to people, he's, he's on the stage, and he says, you know, people say you can't see God, and you can't touch God, so God must not exist. So he said, how about I ask you this? Can you see your brain? No. Can you touch your brain? No. So your brain must not exist. Wow. <laughs> you know, I could touch my brain. I could even see my brain. We could cut my skull off. We could put it in a mirror and you could see it. I mean, that was one of the dumbest arguments ever. Anyway, um, you have to make an argument for deism for me to, to refute. I can't prove a negative. That's just a basic logical thing. I can't prove that gremlins don't exist. I can't prove that God doesn't exist. All I can say is, God, what, what are you talking about? God what? Show me. Prove it. Um, so I can only respond to a positive argument. Oh, I'm, I'm familiar with the arguments for the existence of God, right? A God, some God, you know, whether it's an argument for, uh, you know, for where did things come from or why they're so orderly, all these things. But all of those would be refuted by, by people much smarter than me. So, you know, listen to Sam Harris or to Hitchens or, or go read the philosophers. This goes back a long time. A long time. There's no need for, for me to refute uh, the arguments of, um, uh, I don't know, of, of theists uh, that go back hundreds of years when any good book, you know, there are lots of books out there that do a fantastic job of, of debunking uh, the, the positive arguments for theism of any kind, including, um, including deists. There's no God, so there's nothing to talk about. I mean, God is not a concept one can relate to that, 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 that has any, any cognitive meaning. Um. All right, so bottom line is, um, while Islam 
in general, is the most barbaric and primitive of all religions, while more Muslims advocate for a, call it a fundamentalist approach to Islam, than Jews or Christians advocate for a fundamentalist approach to Islam, to uh, Judaism or to Christianity. That does not mean that any particular Muslim is a bad person any more than it means that any particular Christian is a bad Christian. Now, it does mean it in a probabilistic sense, but what does not judge individuals probabilistically? The problem in the world today is not Islamic immigration. The problem in the world today is not Islamic culture. The problem in the world today is the unwillingness of the West to fight a proper war. And the left here is to blame for a lot of this, but so is the right. It is George, we George Bush's weakness. It is the weakness of the neocons. It is the weakness of those who pretend to stand for America. The unwillingness to define their enemy clearly and an unwillingness to crush that enemy. Their willingness to appease the Saudis, to appease anybody. Yes, America has and the West have no self-esteem. I believe that the greatest enemy the West has today is not Islam. Indeed, I don't think Islam will win. I don't think Islam has any chance of winning. It is so primitive. It is so barbaric. They will be wiped out in minutes if the West decided to wipe them out. The real enemy is the West. The real enemy is Kantian philosophy, Christian morality. That is what is killing the West. Christianity and Kant. And until we overcome those two things, those two elements, Christian forgiveness, Christian love thy enemy, uh, turn the other cheek, love thy, love thy neighbor like yourself, Christian altruism, Christian humility, Christian self-deprecation, loaded up with Kant, Immanuel Kant, that combination is killing the West. It's killing the West from the left. It's killing the West from the right. And what we're seeing as a response is more and more racism, more and more people caring about the color of their skin and wanting to live with people that all look the same. I was fine in Israel with everybody being Jewish and everybody looking exactly like me until I moved to the U.S. and everybody was different. And now I live in Puerto Rico where I suddenly don't fit in. I love it. All right. So you can't judge a particular person based on some generalization you have made based on reading a few books. And the war we're at is not against Islam. It's not against a religion. It's against one interpretation of that religion. If it's against Islam, do we bomb Malaysia? Do we bomb Sudan? Who do we bomb first? Who do we go to war with? I have defined Islam. Islam is somebody who advocates generally for Muhammad as the prophet and Quran as a holy book but it's not any specific interpretation of the Quran, and it's not any specifically views on what is written in the Quran. Um, you, you know, so, so Jason asks, if you can't define Islam, then how can you be sure that Muslims who you trust won't actually support Sharia in the long run? You ask them. <laughs> you, you, you know, how do I know? I, I know a lot of objectivists who have turned racists. How do I know that in the long run they won't turn racists? How do I know? I, I know objectivists. I had good friends who were objectivists who turned and became ultra-Orthodox Jews. I don't know what people are going to do in the long run. I don't judge you now based on the risk of you becoming a nut in the long run. There are lots of people who are going to become nuts in the long run. I'm not afraid of Muslims. I mean, I'm sorry. You guys are hysterical. Uh, hysterical. You're, you're, you're dominated by hysteria. You're also hysterical in terms of funny. I mean, you think the world is going to end because of a bunch of Muslims are going are, are gonna to shoot up, uh, you know, or drive their cars through, through crowds. I've lived it. I've lived through terrorism. I know what terrorism does to a culture. I know how impotent and pathetic and useless they are. I'm not afraid of them. I've lived them. You think you know? 
You don't know. The amount of terrorism you've experienced is nothing. We had an equivalent of a 9-11 every couple of weeks in the early 2000s in Israel. And I'm still not afraid of them. What is the large Islamic sect that is against establishing an Islamic state? Can you name it? I can't name it. They don't have a name. But not everybody in the Muslim world, particularly not every American Muslim, I'd say a majority of American Muslims, against establishing an Islamic state. And when ISIL, ISIS, established itself, very few Muslims around the world affiliated themselves with them. Very few. So even those who say maybe they want an Islamic state, when it comes down to the nuts and bolts of it, they're not going to fight with the Islamic state. They're not going to acknowledge the Islamic state. They're not going to sanction the Islamic state because they're not barbarians. <sighs> there isn't a large movement because, as I said, this is a barbaric, primitive religion. These are primitive people living in primitive places. This, these are people from the poorest parts of the world. And they're not organized. They don't have parties. They're barely surviving. They're barely surviving. But you want to annihilate them all because you think they've all been Laden. And you can't differentiate. You can't differentiate. But that's okay. I, you know, we've had enough of this. It's a depressing topic. Right? Yes, and they lie. So does every bad person lie. There's nothing unique about Muslims in terms of lying. Every, everybody lies who's a bad guy and who wants to attain bad ends. They all lie. Lying is not unique to Muslims. It's unique to all evil people. And some Muslims are evil. Therefore, they lie. And, it, 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 you know, and... Anyway, um, all right, what do we got here? Ah, all right, my Facebook page has been dominated by the racist uh, religionists. Good, always fun to have some of you guys around. Um, let's see, I don't know, did I have anything else to say? Anybody else want to ask a question about Islam, Muslims, what should be done? Um, I do encourage everybody to go listen to my course on the history of the Middle East. I think you'll learn a hell of a lot there. Uh, I've never seen anybody come back to me and said, no, you're wrong about that course. Or my course on the history of totalitarian Islam, where I trace the roots of totalitarian Islam back to the Quran, but then the emergence in modern form with the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, the Wahhabis in, um, in uh, Saudi Arabia, and them splintering off ultimately into Al-Qaeda. And I, I did the course before ISIS, but I predicted ISIS. So I predicted a lot in that course that actually came true. I predicted exactly what would happen if you brought, um, what do you call it, democracy to the Middle East. So it was a good course. I encourage you to read that. I encourage you also to go back and listen to my talks on the morality of war, on uh, building democracy in the Middle East to get a, if you're really interested, uh, that is content. There's a lot of hacks out there who pretend to know the history of Islam uh, that will tell you there was no such thing as a golden age. They're full of it. It's complete BS. Um, or who, uh, you know, who tell you all kinds of stories about history that are just nonsense. So be careful what you read. Not everything is equally true. Um, not equally, everything is equally valid. Um, why would you ban Muslims then if you think there's nothing to worry about? That is what I perceive as a contradiction. I would ban Muslims because we're at war with uh, a certain sect within Islam. And because it's very, very difficult to differentiate as a state, uh, the solution is, in the sh in the, while you're at war, is to ban them. Now, to the extent that you can develop, and I think, I think these things can be developed, extreme vetting processes where you can differentiate between those Muslims who are a threat and those who are not, I would be for that. I don't think the U.S. government does it today. I don't think they do it under Trump. I, don't, I certainly don't think they did before Trump. But even under Trump, they're doing extreme vetting for a very, very small section of the Muslim population who are coming into the country. And, and from countries who've never had or, or rarely have had terrorists, whereas Saudi Arabia has a lot. I mean, again, it's unserious. The Trump administration's approach to this is unserious. And I've never seen a proposal by anybody, by anybody, anybody, 
a serious proposal on how to deal with the threat of, of uh, Sharia, how to, the threat of jihad, of the threat of Islamic domination of the world. I've never seen anybody present a serious alternative. Not a, I mean, everybody complains about mine, but I have never seen an alternative. Building a wall is not an alternative. Immigration constraints are not a solution. You have to have a comprehensive solution. And I think I offered a comprehensive solution in 2002. I've been offering it over and over and over again, and nobody's listening, including people who think they, they're against an Islamic state, but they haven't offered a solution on how to get rid of an Islamic state. All right. Um, somebody says Muslims never go to Europe countries where there's no welfare state. What European countries have no welfare state? Every Muslim, every European country has an, uh, a welfare state. What you really mean is they don't go to countries where the country is not offering immigrants extra welfare. That's true, but that's not only true of Muslims. That's true of everybody who's trying to go to Europe who's poor is going to go to Germany and Sweden because they offer the most, you know, the best, uh, the best stuff for an immigrant. Poland doesn't give you anything if you're an immigrant. They still have a welfare state, but they don't give you anything. Or, or, and other Eastern Europeans are too poor to offer anything. So what do you expect? Immigrants are going to go to where there's money, um, both money in terms of jobs, hungry which doesn't allow immigrants in, is a poor country, barely survives, under, you know, barely produces anything, is quite poor, wouldn't survive. I mean, uh, what's his name? I forget the name of the guy who runs Hungary. Wouldn't survive if not for the European Union subsidizing them. No immigrant is going to want to stay in Hungary. They all want to go to Germany, which is rich, where there are lots of jobs, and where they give you a check and offer you free housing. <laughs> you know? So yeah, incentives matter. Incentives matter. Japan has uh, no migration. It also has a dying population, a shrinking economy, uh, a pathetic future. And um, Japan is horrible. The, and it's horrible that it doesn't allow immigration. And it just, it, it, the fact that people bring up Japan just shows me that it's not an issue of Islam because it's not like the Japanese are afraid of Muslim immigration. The Japanese are racists. And they don't want non-Japanese to be in their country. And that's pretty disgusting and should be called out as disgusting and horrific. And there are really, really bad economic consequences to that. And they're paying those consequences. Um, but that has nothing to do with Islam. It has everything to do with the racism of the Japanese, of Japanese culture. All right. I am going to wrap it up here. An hour and a half on Islam is way too much for me. Um, thank you, Jason, for provoking me into doing this. I don't think you're particularly satisfied with my answers, but <laughs> that's okay. Uh, I'm not here to satisfy you. I'm here to tell the truth. The truth. And I was going to say as I see it, but that is the truth. <laughs> Based on everything that I know, Based on the context of my knowledge, everything I said today is the truth. All right. Um, thanks, everybody. And uh, I know uh, hopefully some of you learned something from this. I hope many of you enjoyed the show. Uh, if you did and if you think uh, people out there can learn something from the show, please share it. Um, please like it. Please support me. Uh, my ability to do these kind of things by not just by asking questions, Super Chat helps. So Jason not only asked the question, but then supported my answers by asking Super Chat questions. Many of you did not. You can go to Patreon and support me through Patreon. You can go to PayPal, paypal.me slash your one book show and make a one time contribution. Uh, and you can come on board tomorrow when I am on with Amy, Amy Peacock, and we're doing the Iran and Amy show. We will be talking about, what are we talking about, Amy? I can't remember. I sent you a couple of audio. Oh, we're talking about um, the free speech issue raised by Trump's comments about uh, uh, the press being the enemy of the people and the response of the press. Uh, so we'll talk about that. Some of you will be happy. Some of you won't be happy with my response and Amy's response. What is the other? I sent you another article, Amy, that was, um, and I can't remember what it was. Anyway, uh, we've, got a, we've got a bunch of good content to talk about tomorrow. That'll be at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. 2 p.m. Eastern Time, the Iran and Amy show. Um, 
I, I'm, I'm hoping we don't do too much on Trump. We'll do the free speech stuff on Trump. I'm hoping we, we do stuff that's not related to Trump as well. The other article I sent to Amy was not about Trump, but I don't remember what it was. It, you know, Amy knows, and I will find out uh, before the show tomorrow. Oh, Elizabeth Warren! Yay, we're going to have so much fun with Pocahontas. We are going to have a blast with Elizabeth Warren tomorrow, my favorite politician, the woman uh, that I, you know, I can't wait for Elizabeth Warren to run for president. It is going to be so much fun. Uh, she is better than Bernie Sanders. She's better than Hillary Clinton. She's almost as entertaining as Donald Trump. Um, wow, this woman is a nutcase and, uh, and uh, an intellectual. She's smart. She's no dummy. So, uh, yeah, I, it's great to have Elizabeth Warren running for president. Let's take all the, the disguises off. Let's take all the pretense off. Let's put up a true, dishonest, ideologically nutty leftist, a real leftist fascist. Let's run somebody like that for president. So we're going to have a blast. Um, we're going to have a blast tomorrow. Um, yeah, and, and by the way, Elizabeth Warren, if you missed it, identified as a capitalist. She loves capitalism. Yes, we're going to have a lot to talk about tomorrow, Amy. This is going to be fun. All right, thanks, everybody. I'm going to go and rest up a little bit, get some sleep. Um, you know, I work, it seems like I work, either work or run errands all the time, all the time. I get, I get a little bit of rest from 10 o'clock to midnight when I go to sleep. All right, I will see you all tomorrow with you on the Amy Show. Don't forget to join us. Don't forget to support Patreon. Um, we're really close to 500, really, really close to 500. I'd really appreciate if some of you would help us get to 500 before the end of this month. It's less than one person a day. We could probably do it just tonight if just some of you who are not supportive of the show and getting all this stuff for free, just go on there and, and contribute two bucks a month. Um, and we would be, we would be in five minutes, we would be there. So I'd really appreciate your support. And um, go Red Sox, best team in baseball by far. They're crushing it this year. They might have the best year they have ever had in history. I'm going to go see the end of the game. Bye, everybody. See you. Oh, nobody told me if the picture quality is better, was better today than usual or not. I, I think I, I, I don't think it is. So let me know. I'm curious if anybody can email me or send me a text or tell me on Facebook or something. Was it better or not? Um, yeah, I, I don't want to talk. I don't want to do a round two about what is Islam. I don't think you know. I mean, and you're not thinking about it right again. And I don't think it's important. I don't think it's important because you don't judge uh, what your definition of Islam is not going to dictate how you treat other people. It would be silly. Um, all right, and I'm done with the topic, right? I've covered it from every angle. I've talked about it for now 17 years, 16 and a half. I'm sick of it. It's, a, it's not a pleasant topic. I'm sure it'll come up. Oh, it appears, good news, it appears I'm going to be doing a panel discussion about this topic, related to this topic, with Douglas Murray. You know Douglas Murray, the, the British intellectual? In London, in September, me and Douglas Murray on stage, um, you know his book, his, his book about the death of Europe. I am really looking forward to it, um, and uh, it should be really interesting. We're going to be talking about who killed Western civilization. And uh, first we have to agree on what Western civilization is. And Douglas Murray's sharp, so I'm going to go. It's me and Douglas Murray on stage with a moderator, and she's really sharp, the moderator. Um, Claire, I forgot her name now. Uh, anyway, that should be a great event. If you are in London, if you're in England, you should come on the train in. It's going to be on a Friday night. So you can spend the night in London, have a weekend there. You can even fly in from the U.S. to that event. So please come. Uh, I'll have more information about that within a few days. We're just looking for a venue for a hall in which we can host this, and then we'll make this final, declare it, and get the marketing rolling. But me and Douglas Murray, we're not debating. We're discussing we're discussing. We're having a civilized discussion about ideas where we might disagree or might not. All right. See you guys. Bye.